Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. This is the home of public programs for UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is KJ Ralph. I am one of the programmers with the Archive, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's 30th anniversary screening of Miracle Mile. So um, this print is, uh, this screening, I guess, is part of our Archive Treasures program, which is a quarterly um, program that we, that we uh, do. And usually we're showing a nitrate film, but, uh, or sometimes we show nitrate prints. But um, this particular film came about for a very specific reason, which I'll get into in just a second. Um, but because we are the largest university-based archive in the world, um, sometimes my job feels a bit like being a kid in a candy store. <laughs> it's really hard to narrow down what we're going to do for this program. Um, but Miracle Mile kind of emerged rather naturally, actually, um, because of a Facebook post. <laughs> so um, actually, the person who posted about um, the website that Steve DeJarnett, the filmmaker, was building for to celebrate the 30th anniversary of, uh, of this film, um, the person who posted about this website and this crowd crowdfunding campaign that he was doing was Kayla Janice, who's here tonight. And she and I are Facebook friends. She's an incredible programmer in her own right. She runs the Miskatonic Institute um, in here in LA, or sorry, and in New York. And she posted about this, this website and, and Steve was saying, you know, I'm still looking for a venue to do a 30th anniversary screening. And I was basically like, me, me, me. Uh, and then we started Facebook messaging and here we are tonight. So the power of the internet bringing people together, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this screening without Steve here in person. So, before we watch this incredible film together, I would love to welcome to the stage to say a few words uh, the visionary Steve DeJarnett. Thank you so much for arranging this. It's what a wonderful venue, and it's going to be amazing. Uh, how many people have seen the film before? Okay. Wow. And for those who haven't, don't spoil it for him. I like to preface it that it's just sort of a fluffy 80s John Hughes romantic comedy <laughs> that, that gets a little less fluffy as it goes along. And that, that's all I'll say about it. But um, anyway, thank you for coming and we'll do a Q&A afterwards. And there'll be a table out there. I have posters and cards and I'll sign anything you have. And, you know, whatever, we'll do all that. Thank you for coming. So, th that was such a, this is my first time seeing it in a theater. That was such a special experience. And there are so many details in this movie that only a true Angelino would add to a movie. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone noticed. It's, it's toward the end, so it's not in a funny scene, but there's a dead body holding a variety. <laughs> Sorry, Hollywood reporter. <laughs> I, and I also, you know, had never really thought about this film as being pre-LA riots, too. A lot of people thought it was over the top when we, when it came out, and then I must have gotten 20 calls during the riots going, you know, it's happening. Yeah. I mean, it did look like that, so I know. Yeah. Um, there are a couple people here tonight who we should probably call out before we get started. Yes, Paul Hasslinger from Tangerine Dream. <laughs> Where is Paul? <laughs> he was here. Okay. <laughs> Raphael Sparge, the voice of Chip. <laughs> he, he he saved the movie in post. Danny De La Paz. Get, get over there. Roger. It, and I, I know uh, Don from the crew and Leo. Yeah, Don, Don's here. And Leo. Yeah. Who all that that action on the street, the the ads, we couldn't have done it without them. You know the great camera crew. Anybody else worked on movies here? I don't know. Yeah. So how many? Oh, Mort, Mort, Morteza. Well, yeah. I mean, talk talking about you know all of that location shooting. Obviously, you're shooting at night. How long is your shoot schedule for all those night shots? It was seven shots? weeks, uh, mainly at night. Um, so seven weeks total. 
I looked at the budget recently. I think it was four four all in, but after contingency and insurance, it was three million dollars to make to put that stuff on screen. You know, it's this not a lot of money. Yeah, and the stunts alone and the, uh, you know, that one shot where Anthony Edwards gets up on the car and you see the scope of what is happening around him and you there's another shot immediately following that where you're looking down Wilshire and it's just all cars the entire way down. That was a, a cheap, cheap mat shot, <laughs> but uh, b we blocked off Wilshire for a night and a half and Gary Jensen, the stunt guy, and, you know, just a few extras, uh, Leo, you know, coordinated all that, so really incredible yeah <laughs> and you know the the other great thing about a movie that's 30 years old is the dissemination of information moves a bit slower in the 80s obviously but that's kind of what makes this movie exactly what it is and so we get you know there's multiple forms of communication there's phones there's TVs there's but it would have it would play out so differently now. Yeah, it's just you know the word of mouth. It's, it's essentially a chicken little story. This guy's and uh, that was a payphone for millennials. There <laughs> that, from from Bill and Ted, you might, or you know, some, or or uh, Doctor Who, you know. Um, <laughs> there are a couple left, and yeah, today, and that was a cell phone that she had. It was the state of the art. <laughs> and is all the graffiti inside the phone booth? Was that Staged graffiti, or I was think that we all? put that on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there is a cockroach in there. In so the phone booth. Somewhere a cockroach craw crawls on him in there. Oh. And oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did not know Stunt, that. stunt roach. <laughs> <laughs> and stunt rats. Stunt rats. Yes, it was a family of rats that, and I had read somewhere that there was a million rats in the palm trees of L.A., <laughs> and so it's a, it's a nice foreboding image. You know, I hadn't heard that until uh, my housemate actually pointed that out, that her dad, like, makes that joke all the time. But he doesn't live here. I just, I didn't know that. that I don't know who did the census, you know. Yeah. You know knocked the rat on census. each palm tree and, like, how many do you have? Asking again? citizenship yeah, questions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I also know that this film is included in Los, the great Los Angeles Plays Itself by Tom Anderson. Very brief in the film. It should be an entire half hour of that I, movie. I, I sat through, I mean, I love that movie. Everyone should see that. Yeah. L.A. plays itself. And it's now on, on DVD. For a while, you just had to go to a screening because they didn't clear the rights. So I went and sat, I don't know, like after two hours or something to see if it was mentioned. And, you know, he's pretty snarky. He's like cutting down That's Blade Tom. Runner and stuff like that. So all of a sudden, I see the hamburger things and he, I think it's something like all Hollywood films lie. <laughs> the, this sign never existed, but it should have. So that was pretty good. He, he didn't slam it, it, it yeah. but he did point out the lie that and it never existed. How much of the, uh, how much of Johnny's, which is still standing, if you drive, it's Wilshire and Fairfax, the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax, and across the street is no longer the May Company building. It's the upcoming uh, Academy Museum. Whenever John that's done. Johnny's, if you listen to the the uh, Chris Horner, the production designer, and Teo and I do a commentary on the, the Blu-ray and the, the DVD. I, I had forgotten some of this. Johnny's is the way we left it. We, uh, you know, we art directed the inside, that blue and orange, that wasn't original. That's the way we left it. There, there were no bulbs in the sign. Teo told me he had the gaffer dip 5,000 bulbs three times in blue paint just for the for the color temperature, and they're still going 30 years later, a lot of them. And, of course, the burger sign never existed. The Johnny's replica sign, there used to be one on a stand. The wind blew it down, so we made a duplicate, which I just had stolen out of storage about a year ago. I mean, like the, 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 the Bob's the, big the, yeah, look the alike guy. Yeah. And the burgers, what's left of them, sort of the tire, you know, fake thing is out at Valley Relics. They're going to try to restore it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but Johnny's is, is still standing, but it's not operational. It's longer. a movie set and, and Bernie's, I guess. <laughs> that, yeah, uh, now it's Bernie's. Uh, and I, we got in there. We got the supporting cast in, you know, most all the supporting cast, at least 12 people, also on the Blu-ray, extras for six hours. Mm -hmm. um, they let us in. They usually, you know, charge 30000 or something. I think I had to drive a 
after rush hour traffic where the cashiers check for 2500 or something. We got in there, and, and it, it was a great reunion love fest. So yeah, that's such a great moment that's caught that you catch on tape. And I do want to talk about the cast. Everybody is working so well together, and it's it's – kind of an intro, not an introduction necessarily for a lot of these actors, but we know so many of them now for the roles that they've played since then. Um, and it's just such a great assembly of people. Yeah, and we, we did that like a one act play. We rehearsed, mm -hmm. you know, and blocked out all the shots and, you know, we had to really be prepared on this. It was very tough to get it on screen for the budget. And yeah, couldn't have done it without the amazing cast. Yeah, the cast is great, and the way that this film looks, too. Does anybody have it on Blu-ray? The Blu-ray looks amazing. Um, if you don't have it, you should probably get it now. Um, and all the special features are incredible. All the audio commentaries are great. But um, the way that this film looks, I again, I had never seen it on film in a theater before, so I didn't know that how authentic all the colors on the Blu-ray are, really. Like, it looks pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, the, the original VHS and DVD version and the version that's on Amazon currently mm -hmm. look terrible. Yeah. They're all washed out, yeah. and it's not even in the right you know format. I don't think so. Yeah, the new version it was a 2K off the inner positive. I would love to do a 4K off the negative and put short films and a lot more extras on a special special edition mm -hmm. someday. Yeah. But um, yeah, and Te but Teo, um, had you worked with him before this or no? Uh, no, I br yeah. I brought Teo over here, and he's never left. Teo von <laughs> Uh I think I tried to bring him over for my other feature just before this, Cherry Two Thousand, mm -hmm. and couldn't get him over from Holland. Uh, but yeah, it was his first film here. Oh, I did not realize it was his first yeah. film. I mean, he's gone on to make oh, to shoot so many incredible. Yeah, never stopped shooting. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of the crew people, I think. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Homme, you know, is like Roger Deakins, Dolly Grip, and, you know, a lot of the crew, Don's always working, everybody, you know, the art department went on to big, big things, yeah. too, so. Teo shot Crossing Delancey, which is one of my yeah. favorite movies of all yeah. time. <laughs> um, so I, I would love to open it up to the audience for questions, because this is such a big packed house, and this is such a special occasion, um, and we have some microphones that'll be going around um, and yeah let's start here in the in the middle if you could wait for the microphone to come to you who is dr. biobrain good question I always get that one uh, that was my cat um, dedicated to my cat uh, cat mayor of Los Angeles two terms First cat to organize the ferals and the alley cats into a political block <laughs> and wrest control away from the prissy breeds that had controlled cat politics in the Southland for you. Anyway, it's a long story. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, yeah, right here. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I was born in 1985 and grew up like three blocks away from uh, the tar pits and all of that. So thank you so much for memorializing in cinematic history the miracle mile of my youth and my so growing up. You're a child of methane. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, is that LA as a city is just not at all known for its public spaces and its civic spaces and all of that. And the slice of LA that you captured is the exception to that rule, right? With the parks and the museums and Johnny's and all of that. So I just, I was wondering if you could speak to that for a second and how that played into your filmmaking. Well, it was written for all those locations and it was amazing that we were able to get them. Uh, Christy Frankenheimer was location person and I don't know how we, re we pulled it off, but we got the locations we needed. There is no heliport on the 5900 building. I don't know what it's called today. They changed the name every once in a while. So we shot downtown. And the gas station, the, the taxi thing was downtown. E otherwise, everything, location is geog geographically accurate for the most part. And it was, that was important to me, to know the lay of the land and, and not cheat it. Is it the equity building now or no? Well, it was Mutual Benefit Life. I didn't yeah. make that up. That was the name of it, which is pretty, you know, Mutual Assured Destruction might have been a better time. But and it's on Wilshire, like near Normandy? Um, no, no, that's the, the 5900 building. Oh, okay, or that's, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. right there across from the museum. Not the equity yeah. building. Yeah, I, I have one more question that I just remembered yeah. I, I didn't ask before. The ending that we saw, 
is that's the ending. The ending. Of there, the there is a happy ending. It's uh -huh. two seconds long. We've run it a couple times, and it's it's on the it's on the 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 extras. It's just the white light coalesces into two diamonds that with some twinkly music, and they <laughs> float away. <laughs> and I must say, John Daly, the head of Hemdale, you know, God bless him. He, um, if you wanted your money, you're never going to get it. But he. You know, he won Best Oscar two years in a row for Platoon, mm -hmm. Last Emperor. He made River's Edge, Hoosiers, Which we just showed here. Terminator, yeah. uh, and you know, a lot of battles. Lot, but at the end, he let me make the movie. That he actually said, "Let's take that ending out." I was on the fence. I commissioned it. I had a friend of mine, Elisa Bello, uh, make that diamond effect, and he said, "That's too upbeat. Let's rip their hearts out." <laughs> and that's a studio head. That's the head of the company. You don't see that today. So Definitely not. You know, yeah. We went bleak. <laughs> uh, I saw a hand go up on the aisle earlier. Yeah. Hey, Steve. I remember that you had said that this took years to make um, prior to it. And then I also am just curious if you could talk about how it got received when it landed. Oh. Well, yeah, I wrote the script and turned it into Warner Brothers. I'd pitched the idea earlier in the year in 1979 when I was seven years old. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> turned it in. So it, it was written in the 70s. Uh, Warner Brothers liked it. Um, they wanted to do it. They wanted to put more writers on. They said it, what it needs is a $150,000 writer. I said, I'll pay me $18,000. i will write 10 more drafts. Um, <laughs> And I was somehow I was savvy enough to ask for it back. You know, they, nobody else came on to rewrite it, um, and they let me have it back. Mark Rosenberg was the head of production. Alan Rosenberg, his brother, you know, plays uh, the young street sweeper Mike, and he's sort of playing his brother. His, uh, Mark Rosenberg was in the SDS, and so Alan's kind of doing that you know, that list of Stokely Carmichael <laughs> or whoever, you know. Uh, He's sort of evo evoking that. And, you know, they liked it, but they let me have it back. I optioned it for a couple of years, and then I had to buy it outright. And I gave all, all the money I made on writing Strange Brew to Warner Brothers, and I owned it outright. Warner Brothers then offered me a fortune to sell it back to not direct, like 400000 in 1982 or three, like, you know. Jim Burkus, the founder of UTA, was my agent. He said, I'm getting you what William Goldman and Robert Town get. And I said, no. Um, and I spent the rest of the decade get, willing it into existence with a lot of incarnations that almost went before. Uh, but, you know, I'm glad I turned the money down and did it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. There were also supposed to be a couple of other. I I, I heard, and at least in the audio commentary, that maybe Carl Sagan was going to be doing the introduction, well, and maybe Walter Cronkite was going to be involved. The, well, yes, actually, in the original script, Car uh, Walter Cronkite did come on television and started to to do it, and then he went, "Oh fuck it," <laughs> and, and <laughs> was crying. So that's in the script, as well as like the first missile that came over, landed right, you know, six blocks away, and was a dud and didn't go off, and because um, I think I read somewhere that half of the Soviet missiles would probably be duds. Um, Carl Sagan, it was obviously kind of written for him, you know, billions of, you know, star stuff, all that. And he chickened out, and so did Walter. You know, and Walter had retired, so it was still, it was a little weird, but, you know. Other audience questions? Um, yeah, right here. <laughs> This, it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, uh, the script was uh, one of the ten best uh, uh, unproduced script. I believe it was the list of what was that uh, American film? I believe Mar it was, was the very Steve Stephen Rubello who did the very first list. I guess it's the blacklist, sort of the same thing. But Stephen Rubello started that. It was an American film and movie uh, tone or movie line later. So it was on the first list with a lot of great scripts, some, some of which have been made. That certainly helped get it made, that it was, you know, at that 
Right, and I, I remember, you know, I was a sound mixer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I remember when I read the script first, first I really was so impressed with it because it really reads like a, a beautiful play. Uh, it, it really re reads like that. And I think your uh, the, the scene in, at, in Johnny's with all the characters and all that, it really indicates that. And yeah, all, all the characters are, are so Double dialogue in the face. Right. And, and just wanted to also add another thing is uh, – I remember clearly uh, the scene on the rooftop when we're shooting that. Uh, the script lady, I, I look around and she was crying. Oh. And I, I asked her what happened. And she said, yeah, it's the dialogue. She was so touched by it that she was crying, actually. Seriously. So, I mean, like, yeah, I, I just want to commend you for <laughs> such a great script for my it, it, thank you for great sound <laughs> more I mean, it was a, it was tough you know out, outdoors you know all that um, yeah so that anyway yeah uh, the original script was an older Harry going back to get his ex after 15 years sort of the grandparent story it was transposed onto that so it wasn't two people meeting cute in the museum and if somebody you know if somebody is ever going to reboot it or redo it i hope they'll use that i there are some caveats that i they have to hire me as the first writer and director i don't control the rights but there's you know well, mgm has it we'll see mm -hmm. there's people talk about it every once in a while doing something with it maybe a six hour you know, thing from midnight to dawn and for net, you know, yeah. Netflix or Amazon, but still real time, I would hope, and no cell phones. Yes, the, the, naturally. The, the cell network would be down and you, you know, because, you know, but I'll, I'll start it, I'll pass the baton, you know, it can be a woman <laughs> protagonist, a woman director, you know, they can go do something with it. Yes, <laughs> um, right here. Oh yeah, his cameo. Oh. On the great? Yeah. My In like the panic scene. My my Hitchcockian <laughs> thing. Other questions? Uh, yeah, down here in the front. Um, I saw this twice in the theater when it came out because the first time I couldn't quite believe what I had seen. Um, because at the time, you'll remember, th this really was the unthinkable. It was like you, you couldn't show this uh, in a movie. I mean, the, the day after, and uh, mm -hmm. there had been a number of, uh, of like serious Testament. movies about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was just curious, at what point in the writing process did you say, no, I'm going to end the world? Oh, from the beginning, and that's why it took 10 years. I would not alter that. Warner Brothers, you know, when they wanted to buy it back, I didn't actually know at the time, but later it's been pretty well established they wanted it for Twilight Zone, the movie. right? Not oh. a four-part thing, just yeah, yeah. as a standalone thing. I don't think that would please anybody. And all they wanted to change was it all happened, and then he woke up at the end, and then oh. it started happening again. <laughs> and it's really like, well, you could just cut that off and still have your movie and have half a million dollars in 1982. Right, because in, in the department store, yeah. it, it begins to look like, oh, it was it, it was all just about people panicking and making right. mistakes and everything. And in the theater, I was like, oh, thank God. It's, it, it's all, it's all going to be okay. And well, then well, that's an important moment. I don't – I hate all those guru books, uh, you know, of like the inciting incident or whatever. I don't even know if that what act that's in. But that's an important <laughs> moment where, great, I'm in a lot of trouble, but at least the world's not ending. Oh shit! I'm not in trouble. We're all in trouble, and predict well, you know when you go out and the SWAT team's going away, and you, you, you then you don't know, you don't know until something goes off. Yeah, right here in the hat. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say uh, I happened to see it when it was first released as well, right here in Westwood. Wow! And oh, wow. Uh, it was a very formative experience for me. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the score with Tangerine Dream and how that experience worked. Paul is sitting right behind you. Um, it was the thrill of my life. I mean, I wrote it to the Sorcerer soundtrack. 
you know, just <laughs> in the only wrote it in the middle of the night playing the Sorcerer soundtrack <laughs> nonstop. So you know, we're low budget movie. You do a rough cut and you put temp music in there. So it was ninety percent sorcerer and other tangerine dream and i think maybe a couple of peter gabriel birdie cues or something just sort of low things and we sent it over there and they loved it and john daly and hemdale stepped up and paid whatever the price which was not i'm sure not what was in our budget and i got to go over to vienna and work with paul and edgar and it was wonderful and you know it was i mean it you know, Paul, why don't you, you want to talk about this? Say, say something. Because it was a different experience. There's a great interview with Paul, too, on the turbine German one in the French Blu-ray and the UK Blu-ray, too. It wasn't on the Kino. We filmed it later. But yeah, it's, I mean, it was a, it was a long time ago. Uh, and, you know, it's funny um, to watch it after that long period and um, a it's holding up well you know as it's as a, as a movie experience I can really enjoy it and and still when I look at the music at least for a third of it I'm going ah that could have been different and <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> it doesn't pick up right there uh, it's, it just never you can never turn it off you know so in a way uh, and you know knowing you over the years also you you start a conversation and you just continue the conversation and this is just part of our conversation in a way, you know, and, and like a good part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I was always curious for you to come in because we didn't work in Vienna. We worked outside. Right, you know, yeah. An yeah. hour outside of Vienna. So you fly into Vienna. You, you drive an hour outside of Vienna. And you put into this creative environment studio. And you're basically in another world, right? How strange or different was that for you? I think it was one of my first times to Europe or something, and well, it was great. You were, yeah, it was it was you know that really, you know, working every day, eating there. Finally, we went into Vienna, and I had sushi and flew home. <laughs> it's my first European experience, but it, yeah, it was it, it was incredible because you guys had had it all laid out, and we tweaked some stuff, but it was it was more. You know, it was nothing major, and I remember how, you know, you, you know, you put in the risky business cue in the temp mi music, you know, where the bird and the cigarette, and rather than be offended or going, you can't use that. It's like, no, we did it, but we changed enough of it so it's a different, and yeah, it was just everything was cued exactly the way we all wanted it, uh, rather than sending it to a sound. I think the sound, the music editor just had to like cut it there was nothing for them to do well i saw that actually rick klein was the music mixer on it who i worked with later on various movies yeah. so there's always a through line which is yeah. kind of interesting but you know i remember uh watching the film for the first time with edgar and basically going yeah you know we were that's a great movie and when that effect happens and that's been you know i've been now working in films for quite a while it it sort of enables whatever then follows. You know, you you generally like the film, you respond to the film, you have resonance with the film. The score kind of comes naturally. You know, you don't need to do it. You just let the need to let it flow, and that's what happened on this project. Um, doesn't happen on many projects. You know, so you're just lucky when one of those strikes. I think it was meant to be because it was conceived with, you know, a certain amount of Tangerine Dream music, and then. Yeah, it was, it was just a perfect thing that worked out, and, and I think it was amazing. And I don't think the film would work. I think it would be at like 65% without the score. I really do. I mean, I like I love my movie, but it's without that, that's, that's a major character. It's a clock, and it's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you, Paul and Edgar. You know, I think this is our, our last question oh. here. I, I will be outside yeah. signing posters and answering any questions and stuff like that, too. So. Yeah, sounds great. Um, I just want to say that the, the score is the most listened to album I own. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you very much, Paul. Um, <laughs> not just the most listened to Tangerine Dream album, um, which I own 30 of. Um, <laughs> could, you, could you keep talking about um, the feeling of... 
you did not live in the United States at the time, is that right? And so this story is what just coalesces the entire 80s um, paranoia about um, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And what was the feeling outside the United States of looking at the Russians and the Americans? Uh, how did yeah, how did that come forward? Well, it was an interesting time in Europe because it was the Reagan years here, yeah. and uh, you know many people don't. Uh, Reagan was generally liked and appreciated here. He it was the exact opposite in Europe, and it, it sort of strengthened fears about the Cold War and about possible nuclear disaster. So, you know, we were very receptive to the to the theme. Uh, the story. However, you know, what's, what's really trippy for me is that at the time, even though I had toured in the U.S., L.A. was still foreign territory and it was sort of this strange, wonderful, and especially how it's portrayed in this film, you know, it's a, it's, it's a strangely surreal, beautiful landscape, at least through my European eyes it was. Now, as a resident of Los Angeles, 30 years later, I know all the points, you know, I know all the different landmarks and all the, the, I know the angles that you're taking for them, you know, and I, I feel like in a weird way uh, I'm connected to it now, but I wasn't when we made the movie and when I wrote the music. So it's a, it's a strange double loop that's, that happens when I watch it now and go like, oh yeah, it's that corner, oh, this <laughs> is, I know that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's my home turf now, it's become my home turf. So it's a it's an interesting loop for sure. I think that's a really beautiful place to end, actually. Um, so uh, thank you so much for being here, Steve, and for letting us show this movie and for wanting this to be the home of the 30th. <laughs> <laughs>